I talk about, about living in God's peace. You know, and a little bit of a confession here. I, you know, we, we turn our notes in so that we can put slides together and we can have it on the app and all that. And they want us to turn that stuff in by Thursday. And pastors asked me to speak a few weeks ago when they were getting ready to leave. And we were gone on vacation and it got back. We've been busy running around. But God gave me the word about speaking on this. But usually he'll, he'll lay out some points and kind of give me the notes and things. Well, a bit of a confession, it was 6 o'clock this morning <laughs> when that all came. Pastor Monica was messaging me yesterday, did you get your notes in yet? And I'm like, yeah, no, I haven't yet, so I'm working, I'm working on that. And I didn't have nothing, you know. But, 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 you know, I just walk in peace, and God said, hey. And I woke up this morning, and he just laid it all out. So it's like fresh, hot pancakes, fresh off the griddle, okay? So we'll go with this. <laughs> all right, so peace, right? I always like to look back at definitions. Just as an engineer, I like to you know, study the facts and kind of look at things. So what does peace mean? I look back at Webster's Dictionary. It says a state of tranquility or quiet. Okay, that sounds pretty good. A standard belief or a common belief that the world is kind of adapted to is it says this. It says peace is a concept of society or socially friendship and harmony in the absence of hostility and violence. In a social sense, peace is commonly used to mean a lack of conflict and freedom and fear of violence between individuals and groups. Would we say that we're in a place of peace right now in the world? No. Church view might look at it this way. It says, The peace of God, which transcends all understanding, is the harmony and calmness of body, mind, and spirit, and that supersedes earthly circumstances. And I looked in the Strong's Concordance. I thought this was really interesting. Strong's definition is, says this. It's one peace, quietness, and rest. That place of rest. And, the, and you break down and you look at the root of, of that word. And it's to join, to tie together into whole. Wholeness. When essential parts are all joined together, is peace. It's literally God's wholeness. And I'll be honest, I had never looked at peace in that way before. And you think about wholeness, you think about as a, as a person, right? We're our spirit, soul, and body. So to have peace, we need to have peace in all areas of our body. Look at 1 Thessalonians 5.23, and it says this. It says, as, and many... And may the God of peace himself sanctify you through and through, separate you from profane things, make you pure and holy, consecrate you to God. And may your spirit and soul and body be preserved sound and complete and found blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. God wants us complete in every area, spirit, soul, and body. Nothing missing, nothing broken. That's wholeness. Wholeness is nothing missing, nothing broken in every area. And he wants that for us. What does the world want to offer us? Something a little bit different, right? It says it pretty clear here in, in John 14, 27. It says, Peace I leave you, my son. Peace I now give you and bequeath to you. Not as the world gives do I give you, do do not let your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Stop allowing yourselves to be agitated and disturbed. And do not permit yourselves to be fearful and intimidated and cowardly and unsettled. The world wants to do what? It wants to put us into a place of fear. And from fear, why, why do they want to try to put us into a place of fear? Because then that's where they can control us. Right? John 16, 33 says this. I have told you these things so that in me you may, be, you may have perfect peace and confidence. <clears throat> in the world you have tribulation and trials and distress and frustration. But be of good cheer. Everybody say good cheer. Good cheer. Take courage. Be confident. Certain und undoubted. For I have overcome the world. This is Jesus talking. I have overcome the world. That's good news, guys. I have deprived it of power to harm you and have conquered it for you. Have we seen tribulations and stress 
today? A lot, right? A lot of stuff going on. Jesus, but the good news is, is that Jesus has overcome the world. So where does that put us? How does that help us to, to move into that? We're going to get into that, okay? I found two scriptures that really kind of, when I read, was reading through this and talking about peace, there's two scriptures that really stood out as kind of odd to me, and I had to reread it like four or five times and then, and then dig into it. Check this out. This is the first one. It says in Matthew, Matthew 10, 34, it says, Do not think I have come to bring peace upon the earth. Let me read that again. Do not think that I have come to bring peace upon the earth. I have not come to bring peace but the sword. Jesus is the word, right? And gave us authority over the earth to rule and reign. He came to bring peace between men and the Father, not the earth. Look at another verse. Luke 12, 12, 51 says, Do you suppose that I have come to give peace upon the earth? No, I say to you, but rather division. When you go back and you study this, if you look at peace, the majority of the times when it talks about peace, it's talking about the connection and relationship between people, not the earth and the earth's system. God didn't come. He gave us authority to rule and reign on earth. He came to give us peace amongst each other. Even when the angels sang at Jesus' birth, you know, we, I think we, we say it wrong a lot of times. It says, peace on earth, goodwill towards men. No, it says, peace on earth, for men, between men. If you go back and actually read the scripture where it says that, it's actually peace between men. And it's then peace between him. So the word peace, when you study that, most of the time when you look at it, it always points to the connection either between God, the Father, or with each other. Isaiah 26.3, one of my favorite verses. I love this. <clears throat> Isaiah 26.3 says, You will guard him and keep him in perfect and constant peace, whose mind, everybody say mind, mind. whose mind, both its inclination and its character, is stayed on you. But he, because he commits himself to you, leans on you and trusts in you. This is the real key here, guys. This is the real key. Your mind stay on him. Our spirit is saved. When we make Jesus the Lord of our life, we are sealed and saved, and, and God speaks. The Holy Spirit lives within us. We have everything we need inside of us, right? But our mind has to be renewed. Our mind is where the disconnection can begin to happen, right? Now, Jamie loves when I'm on my phone and she's trying to have a conversation with me, right? Because what happens? We're not being connected. And I'm like, oh, babe, i got to take care of something real quick. And she's like, I was talking to you. <laughs> or heaven forbid the TV's on and it's a good movie or something. I'll be like, mm. <laughs> Right? Because what happens is my connection with her turns to something else. And what is this verse saying again? It says, in perfect peace, in perfect and constant peace, whose mind is stayed on him. So as we keep our mind connected with God, it allows us to stay in that perfect place of connection and allow that perfect place of peace between him. Okay? So don't let the distraction of the world pull you away from the connection with God. Romans 8, 6 says this. It says, For to set the mind on the flesh is what? Death. To set our mind on the flesh, or a carnal mind, or carnal thinking, taking care of our, 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 our physical presence and being. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. Now let me say this, we don't ignore our body, right? We are, our, the body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So our body is important. But if our focus is only on our body, our mind is only focused on that part of it, and we're ignoring the Spirit of God, and we're ignoring our spirit, then what happens? We're leading ourselves to, to death, right? We've got to make sure that our mind is connected with the Father, and we bring our, align, our body into alignment with the Word. Why do we fast and pray? It helps bring the body into alignment. Say, no, body, you're, I'm bringing you into submission to what God wants. I'm bringing you submission into, my, into the Spirit of God and keeping connected there. 
Okay, where does our authority come from? Our authority comes from our spirit, not our flesh. So if we're focused on our flesh, then the authority we're going to have is only going to be earthly or fleshly authority, whatever we can accomplish on our own. And we're going to miss out on what God has for us and the authority that he's trying to bring through you into different circumstances. Okay? We're going to walk through a story. You guys know most of my style of teaching. I like to take a story out of the Bible and just really dig into it and kind of break it down and kind of look at it verse by verse and really help bring out Revelation. And this was kind of exciting as I was going through this this morning. Again, sorry for the <laughs> last minute, right? You know, but God's good. This is the story of Elijah. How many know the story of Elijah? Okay, a lot of different pieces to it. This is the story of Elijah when God calls him to go back to the king and he challenges him out to Mount Carmel. Okay. Now, I don't have all the verses displayed up on there. All the verses are in your app, so if you're following on the app with the notes, they're all going to be there. But there's, there's a few ones that we'll display, but most of them I'm just going to read and have you kind of follow along with me, okay? So this is in 1 Kings chapter 18, reading, we're going to be going through 1 through 39. After many days, the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go, show yourself to Ahab. Now, Ahab was the king over Judah at that time, right? And unfortunately, if you go back a few chapters, he had, had uh, Jezebel came into the picture with him. She brought in the prophets of Baal, and they basically killed off almost all of the prophets of, of God at that time of, of Israel, all but a few that uh, Obadiah had saved. So go show yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. Now, if you know the story, Elijah had prayed, and, it, and the rain had stopped, and this is now the third year that there had been no rain on the land. How many can say that would be a little bit of a problem, right? So Elijah went to show himself to Ahab. Now the famine was severe in Samaria. And Ahab called Obadiah, who was the governor of his house. Now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly. For when Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord, Obadiah took a hundred prophets and hid them by fifties in a cave and fed them with bread and water. And Obadiah said, or Ahab, excuse me, said to Obadiah, go into the land and, the, and all the fountains of water and to all the brooks. Perhaps we may find grass to keep the horses and mules alive and that we lose none of the beasts." So they divided the land between, between them to pass, to pass through it. Ahab went one way, and Obadiah went another way, each by himself. Okay, so they're going out in the land, trying to find any kind of water, any kind of nutrients for their animals to, to survive, basically. As, oh, as Obadiah was on his way, behold, Elijah met him. He recognized him and fell on his face and said, <clears throat> Are you... Lord Elijah. He answered him, It is I. Go tell your Lord, behold, Elijah is here. Now, Elijah had been known at this time to be, you know, moving around, and the Spirit of God would literally move him from place to place and, and had been protecting him. Now, when he said this to, when Elijah said this to Obadiah, it was kind of an interesting response. In verse 9, it says this it says, And he said, what sin have I committed that you would deliver your servant into the hands of Ahab to be slain? Kind of an interesting response, right? Because now here he's presenting himself, and Obadiah now panics, like, what have I done to you? What sin have I caused that you're going to ask me to go do this thing? You wouldn't think it'd be a big deal, but we read on, we can see why he feels this way. <clears throat> As the Lord your God lives, there is no nation or kingdom where the Lord has not sent to seek you. Okay? So Ahab's been on the hunt for Elijah for three years now. And every nation, every kingdom they've gone into, looking for Elijah. And now Elijah shows up. And when they said, he is not here, he took an oath from the kingdom or nation that they had not found, found you. So he was literally making the people, these other people swear that I had not seen Elijah or did not know where he was at. And now you say, go tell your Lord, behold, Elijah is here. And as soon as I am gone from you, the Spirit of the Lord will carry you, I know not where. 
So when I come to tell Ahab, and he cannot find you, he will kill me. So Obadiah was fearful that Ahab, he would bring Ahab to the location, or bring Ahab there, and Elijah would be gone, and Obadiah would be dead. But I, your servant, have feared and and revered the Lord from my mouth. Was it not told to my Lord what I did when Jezebel slew the prophets of the Lord, how I hid a hundred men of the Lord's prophets by fifties in a cave and fed them with bread and water? And now you say, go tell your Lord, behold, Elijah is here. He will kill me. Now this is where it starts getting interesting, okay? Elijah said, as the Lord of hosts before whom I stand, I will surely show myself to Ahab today, okay? So he was going to make a promise. Elijah saying, listen, the Lord told me to come back. I'm now going to present myself to you. Okay, so after three years of famine, after three years of, of uh, them looking for him, he came back in. And what we're going to see in the story is how Elijah walks in such a place of peace, confidence, and authority all at the same time, right? So he immediately tells Ahab, or tells Obadiah, surely as I stand, I will not go, and I will come to you. Now, if we look at some comparisons of, of people who stand in confidence, stand in a place of calmness, think of like a, like a police officer, for example. If a police officer came on a scene and two people are fighting, and the police officer steps into the middle of it and starts yelling and arguing with them, what's going to be the credibility of that police officer? He's going to be no better than the two of them, Right? Police officers come on the scene. Well, they come in. They come in with calmness. They want to hear the details. They want to see the facts. They want to understand what's going on. But they have to maintain a level of composure. But they're backed with authority. They have the authority coming in that situation. Or what about a judge sitting on a stand? You got the two people in the courtroom fighting against one another. What if the judge came down off the stand and started arguing amongst amongst them and trying to debate? That's not his place, right? But the judge and the police officer have places of authority, but they have to remain in a place of calm and rest to know what the right thing is to do. And we're going to see that with Elijah as he walks through this. Verse 16, so Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. Okay, Verse 17 says, when Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, are you he who troubles Israel? Okay, so the first thing he says, he meets him. Are you the one that's troubling Israel? Because what did Elijah do? He's the one that prayed for no rain, right? And Elijah is now standing before Ahab. Ahab could be the one to take his life. They've already taken out all the other prophets. Ahab's now standing there and knowing that Elijah is the one that's done this. And he's saying, why are you here? You're the one that's causing all this trouble. Amen? And we see this many times in Scripture. How many times did we see Jesus in a situation where they were literally stones in the hand and they were ready to cast Jesus out? They were ready to come and attack him. And Jesus stood there in a place of calmness and rest. And many times you see where he says he just walked by them and walked right out of the situation. And that's what I love about all this story with Elijah, is he's standing here in a place of, of peace and authority that he was able to stand before Ahab, who has been hunting him for three years, stand in a place to be able to come before him and now say, it's time to make things right. Okay? Are we willing to stand before God when God calls us to a challenging place? Are we ourselves, when God challenges us to step out into something, or we get challenged with something and we know what God's saying to us, are we, will, are we willing to stand firm and stand calmly and stand in peace and authority? Right? What does the Bible say? Stand firm. And just as the police officer and a judge has the authority of all the, the backing powers behind them, we have all of heaven behind us. We have all of the authority and the power that heaven provides in us 
to work through us that we can go out and stand in confidence. Verse 18, Elijah replied, and I love this. He says, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house by forsaking the commandments of the Lord and by following the, uh, the bowels. Elijah stood in a place of authority, right? He knew who was the ones that were at wrong, okay? <clears throat> he had a direct word from God, go show yourself to Ahab. He had the direct word and the timing of, to know that, hey, I need you to go and take care of this. Elijah knew he had the full backing of heaven behind him. Verse 19, therefore, now it's what's interesting here, when someone's in authority, right, they start calling the shots. They start saying what needs to happen. Now remember, Ahab's the king. He's got all these people behind him. And what's Elijah do? He now starts shouting the orders. He starts telling Ahab, you're the one that's at fault, and this is what we're going to go do. Check this out. Verse 19, therefore, send and gather to me all Israel at Mount Carmel, and the 450 prophets of Baal, and the 400 prophets of the goddess Asher, who eat at Queen Jezebel's table. So Elijah now is the one telling him what to do. He was in this place of peace and authority that he was going to take his stand and exactly bring forth what God needed to happen. Verse 20, so Ahab sent to all the Israelites and assembled the prophets of Mount Carmel. Now verse 21, it says, Elijah came near to all the people and said, How long will you halt and limp between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people did not answer him with a word. What was Elijah doing here? He was calling them out. He says, hey, it's time. It's time for you guys to either recognize what you're doing and make it right, or we're going to have to proceed with another solution, right? How many times does God help us? How many times when we mess up, God's willing to step in and help correct us, right? And that's where as we learn, as we, we enter in, and we keep that connection with God and that, that peace with God, and he shows us things, he says, hey, I need you to make a little bit of an adjustment here. I need you to do something a little different here. Now we're willing to say, yes, Lord. Okay, I see where I made that mistake. Forgive me and move on and, and take that place to move forward in. So Elijah's giving them this opportunity. And I love this because God is always merciful. He's always willing to give someone another chance to make it right. No different than you and I, no different than the people that come. He's always willing to help us make a change do it differently, look at things the other way, and he gave them this opportunity to do it. But what did it say? And the people did not answer a word. So they all stood there. Say, what are you going to do, Elijah? <laughs> right? Verse 22, Then Elijah said to the people, I, I only remain a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. That's a, big, that's a big odds, right? 450 guys against one. Not what you want to see. And he does this. He says, let two bulls be given. Let them choose one bull for themselves and cut it into pieces and lay it on the wood and put no fire to it. I will dress the other bull, lay it on the wood, and put no fire to it. Then, <clears throat> excuse me, then you call on the name of your God, and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the one who answers by fire, let him be God. And all the people answered, it is well spoken. Now, I, find this, I found this really fascinating as I, as I dig into this. <clears throat> we know the stories, and I'm sure most people knew the stories of God and how he delivered them from Israel or from uh, Egypt, and he brought them all out, and all those crazy miracle signs that he had done. You never hear of any kind of crazy, cool miracles from Baal. So uh, there's 450 guys here. It's like, he just said, let's put something on the altar, put a bull on the altar, and, and call your God down to put it on fire. I'm like, what experience are they going off of? I was just like, really? Oh, my gosh. I mean, you think about the challenge that's given here. and they're saying, Oh, yeah, this is great. We can do this, right? 
So they had to call down fire before. Had they done it before? Don't know, right? Or were they just operating blindly in their own deceptions? You ever hear of herd mentality, right? A group of people start coming into it. You know, they, I, I love some of the illustrations that I've used with youth and other places. I'll, we'll get the whole group except for one guy or one person to say, hey, I'm going to give an answer, and I, and I want you guys to all say the wrong answer. And, and the person that knows the answer, that's not right, but doesn't know what's going on, before you know it, they'll say the wrong answer just because they want to go along with everybody else, right? So what was happening here it was just like the herd mentality, and they're all just coming along for the ride. You're completely deceived, thinking that they're going to be able to continue forward. What are we seeing today? I mean, there's so much change that people are trying to push. So many different things that aren't right that people are trying to, to bring forth and to make happen. And they're deceived. Many of them are deceived in what they're seeing, deceived in what they're saying. They're putting, you know medicines and things as literally as God's thinking this is the cure this is going to save us all okay there's great medicines out there there's great doctors out there but if our faith and trust just like if we put our faith and trust in our flesh it's going to lead to death if we put our faith and trust in worldly systems it's going to lead to death we have to trust God and God will use things God will use things on this earth to help us absolutely but we can't put our faith and trust in man Verse 25, Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, Choose one bull for yourself and dress it first. For you are many, and call on the name of your God, and put no fire under it. So they took the bull given them, dressed it, and called on the name of Baal from morning until noon, saying, O Baal, hear and answer us. But there was no voice, no answer. And they leaped upon and or limped about the altar they had made. So they called, they called, this all went on all morning until noontime, and no answer. I mean, they even started leaping on top of the altar. I mean, I couldn't even imagine this thing. has got a, a cut-up bull on it, and these guys are starting to jump on it, like they're jumping on it. It's going to cause the fire or something. I don't know. It's crazy. Okay? Now, this is funny. Verse 27. At noon, Elijah mocked them. Okay? A cry aloud for, for his... For he is a God, either he is mussing, which is like meditating, or he has gone aside, or he is on a journey, or perhaps he's asleep and must be wakened, okay? Elijah began to really challenge him here, right? Began taunting them. Now, put that in the modern day perspective. How well do you think that would go over for somebody? Yes, this man of God was in a rally or someone else's rally, and he starts mocking all of them. Wouldn't go too well. He'd probably get kicked off of Facebook, <laughs> cut off of YouTube, right? He'd be gone. Verse 28, and it says, And they cried aloud and cut themselves after their customs with knives and lances until blood gushed out of them. So I guess they figured the cut-up or cut-up sacrifice wasn't enough, so they started cutting themselves, thinking human blood was going to help entice Baal to come down and bring the fire, but that didn't happen either. Verse 29 says, Midday passed, and they played the part of prophets until the time of offering the evening sacrifice. But there was no voice, say no voice, no answer, and no one who paid attention. Right? So they went on and on and on, and were not getting a response out of, out of, their, out of their God. God really challenged me on something here, and I want to challenge you with this. Are there times when we step out of that place of peace with God and we start crying aloud, we start praying louder, we start worshiping louder, all in an effort to get God to do something? Now I'm talking about our God, right? We have to be careful as believers that we don't step out of our peace and connection with God to try to go make something happen. God wants us to be in full confidence that when we speak our word, that when we speak the word, that we have the confidence in us. Out of us flows rivers of living water. And when we speak his word, we're speaking forth his promise. We believe it to come to pass. That's the word of the Lord. 
And when he gives you a word, he'll back it up. He'll stand behind it. But you stay in confidence. You stay in peace in that place of rest, that knowing that God's got it and God is going to take care of it. We have to be careful with that. Amen? Amen. Amen. Verse 30, Then Elijah said to all the people, Come near me. And all the people came near him, and he repaired the old altar of the Lord that had been broken down by Jezebel. So she went to the extent of not just killing the prophets, but literally was tearing everything down that the Lord had had built up. Then Elijah took twelve stones according to the number of tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be your name. And with the stones, Elijah built an altar in the name of the Lord. He made a trench about the altar as great as would contain two measures of seed. He put wood in order and cut the bull in pieces and laid it on the wood and said, Fill four jars with water and pour it on the burnt offering and the wood. And he said, Do it a second time. And then he said, And they did it a second time. And he said, Do it a third time. And they did it a third time. Okay, you guys getting a picture of this? So he brings everybody together, and now he starts to rebuild the altar. He prepares the altar, builds it back up to the way it was like God had designed it, puts the wood, puts the sacrifice on it, and then he dumps water on it. Rough estimates, they say the trench would hold about six gallons of water, and it filled the trench, and he soaked everything down, right? It says the water, in verse 35, it says the water ran about the altar and filled the trench also with water, right? Why do you think Elijah was doing this? You ever think about that? I love this. And what got you, I, got, I said, God, was he testing you? I asked God this, like, all right, was he testing you? I don't think God, he was testing God, right? He was testing himself. I'm going to make this so spectacular that there's no way that no one can say it's anything but God's power to do this. They can't say I may have slipped in some, some coals, some hot coals under the wood while I was putting it on or something like that. No, we're going to douse this thing down, water it down so it's just completely saturated, right? Usually when you want to make a fire, you make a fire with what kind of wood? Dry wood, right? Not now wet wood and everything being soaked. So He's making sure that there's no chance of any deception, any trickery, anything like that. And he's really putting himself in a place here, again, at full peace. Think about this. Elijah is in such a place of peace here that he knows God has his back, that God is going to take care of this. What was the word that God gave Elijah? The only word was, go show yourself to Ahab. That was the word he gave him. And that's all Elijah needed to know that this is the time for me to step out and to make things right. Verse 36. In the time of the offering of the evening sacrifices, Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant. Now recognize he knew his place, right? I love that too. He knew who God was. He knew that he was a servant of the Lord. He was a prophet of the Lord that God spoke to him, but he only was a servant to bring forth what God was doing and needing to get done in time. I am your servant, and I have done all these things at your word. Now, again, what was the word that God gave him? He didn't say, go cut up a bowl and go do this and go do that. The word was just go present yourself. Go show yourself to Ahab. But that's all he needed. Elijah was giving God an opportunity to show his power. He was operating in a place of peace and authority, hearing God's voice. He was still connected with God. He was still able to hear what God was saying, even though God was working through him at that time. Now, the same is true for us. When we're in that place of connection with God and we're at peace with God, God can give us maybe just one word. One word that'll allow you to step out and go do something. To go heal the sick, go lay hands on the sick, go preach the gospel, right? We had a family member once go through a real hard time. And I can remember Jamie and I praying about it and God gave us one word, one word for that family member. And 
Everybody else is saying, you need to do this, you need to do that, you need to do this. Oh, don't let that happen, and they're going to go, you know, do this. God gave us one word, and we, in, in faith and peace, we said, you know what, God, we're going to trust you more than what everybody else is saying. And we watched that family member walk out victoriously. Now, it took a couple years, and that was hard, but it, but it came to pass exactly what God had shown. Had we tried to do all these other things, God showed us some of the things that were going to happen if we pursued these other paths that everybody was saying, this is the right thing to do. They were good things, and it's not that they were bad things to do, but what God showed us is that those things will push this family member so far away that it'll, it, it'll change their life. And so in protecting them, we listened to what God wanted. One word. One word is all you'll need. God will give you word. And sometimes you're thinking, well, I need, a, I need the whole plan. God, that would be great. You know, it would have been great to have more of this two weeks ago that I could have been studying, right? You know? But it's okay. When we're at peace with God, I've been, and I've been completely at peace with God all week, knowing that God will bring exactly what we, I need to hear, what you guys need to hear. I trust him that way, that he'll be faithful to bring forward exactly what we need. He gave me the one word was peace, that that's what he wanted me to talk about. So I've been thinking about it and thinking about it for weeks, but, you know, all of this just kind of flowed together this morning. So God has it. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. One word. So verse 37, it says, hear me, O Lord, hear me that this people may know that you, the Lord, are God and have turned their hearts back to you. I love when he says that, hear me, O Lord, hear me, because it reminds me of the story of Jesus when he raised Lazarus. What does Jesus do? Lazarus dies. He's in a tomb for four days. He comes to the tomb. He says, roll back the stone. And Jesus pauses for a moment, remembers his authority. And what's the first thing he says? Father, I thank you that you hear me. I thank you that you hear me. And we have to have that same confidence that when we walk into a situation, just like Elijah getting ready to speak out here, he had the word to go present himself, but now he's in, he's in a place where he's setting up this whole thing, right, with the altars and bringing up everybody on the mountain, right? He's setting all that up to speak in confidence and bring God's plan to pass. Verse 38 says, Then the fire, everybody say the fire. Come on. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood. Everybody say, and the wood. And the stones. And the dust. <laughs> and also licked up the water in the trench. I mean, come on. It's like the fire comes down. And I love that because not only, you know, I think Elijah was like, well, I'm going to put a lot of water on to make sure, you know, I'm like there's no like way that I could have done this. But God just comes down, and he just takes it all, right? Now, here's what's interesting. You know, as an engineer, I think, oh, man, that's, that's got to be really hot, right? So wood burns at, like, what, 400 degrees, I think, between 300 and 500 degrees. Stone melts, okay, not even burns, but melts between, like, 1,500 and 3,000 degrees, right? Super hot, depending on the type of rock it is. Dust, I don't even know what dust is. dirt, right? It's, it's already burnt coal or ash, whatever, but just to think that all that got consumed, I'm sorry, but my mind, I start thinking about those times I'm lighting the grill and the gas pops in my face and I lose my eyebrows or my arm hairs or something like that. You know, here's Elijah standing next to this thing and it comes down at thousand degrees and burns all this up and he probably didn't have a singed hair, right? And he stands there and it just like that comes down and it burns it all up. God's complete unlimited power just take care of taking care of it right there. Amen? I love that. In verse 39, it says, When all the people saw it, they fell on their faces. I sure hope they would at that point, right? They fell on their faces. The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. So right there, they knew that, okay, God's not messing around. God has called us. Now, here's the sad part. His member Elijah gave the 450 people the prophets gave them all, really, the opportunity to repent and make things right. But they didn't, right? So those 450 prophets, prophets were all basically taken siege, and they were all killed. And then Elijah tells Ahab the rest of the story. I don't, I don't have the verses here, but Elijah then goes, and now he prays for rain. The, peop, the hearts of the people have been turned back to God, 
And now he goes and prays for rain. You guys know the story. He prays for rain. He sends a servant out seven times. And on the seventh time, he sees the cloud that looks like a hand. And then he runs back and water and rain returns to the land. And it just amazes me that place that Elijah walked in, that place of peace and complete confidence. I mean, to truly face somebody like the king, King Ahab, who's been hunting him for years. And then to set up the whole thing on Mount Carmel with everybody there. I mean, any one of them at any time could have just come over and tried to take him out, but he wasn't. He was being protected. He was in this place of peace and confidence, and he was being protected and at the whole time. And God was right there with him. God was protecting him, and God was there with him the whole time. Amen? Amen. How do we stay in God's peace? Okay? Three simple points. Nothing too crazy. Number one, do good. Everybody say do good. Okay. Romans 2.10 says, But glory and honor and heart peace shall be awarded to everyone who habitually does good. Jew, the Jew first and also the Greek. Okay. How many of you, let's be honest, you're driving down the road on the interstate and you see a police officer in the median. What's the first, your first response? Hit the brakes. You guys need to repent and start praying here. Come on, some of you, I know, you hit the brakes right away, right? Why? Because you're like, oh my gosh, I'm probably speeding, right? If our first response is always, I might be doing something wrong, that's a heart check. Listen to your spirit. Your spirit will warn you about, hey, this may not be right. You might not want to do this because it could lead you into a path that's off course, right? So listen to your spirit. Do the things that are right. I, I've learned for myself, I know before I was saved, you know, did all kinds of goofy stuff. And some of those habits that I established in that carried over even after I got saved. But the difference was, and I started seeing the consequences from those things. And I started saying, wow, I need to make these things right. Okay? And I have a great spouse who reminds me all the time, you need not to do this. <laughs> Keep us in correction and keep us in line. But the Holy Spirit will always teach you, will guide you, and help you along those ways. Number two, relax. Okay? Don't be so anxious. One of our favorite verses we use on our petition forms, Philippians 4, 6 through 7, says, Do not be anxious about every, anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Right? We use that on our petition forms, supplications, petitions, and we, we put those things before God so that we can come in and say, hey, God, this is what I need, this is what's going on. But look at verse 7, right after it. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Right? So as we bring those things in, it gives us the peace and confidence that God's taking care of these things. I don't have to burden with them. I don't have to worry with them. Is there still something I have, a part I have to play? Yes. I still need to see. I still need to see the promise. I still need to speak faith. I still need to speak to that mountain and speak to that issue with the word and command that thing to go, command sickness to go. There's things I still have to do, but now I know I have the peace and the confidence of God with me God behind me, supporting me, that I can walk in peace and confidence into those things. And I love that it says, surpasses all understanding, right? Back to the mind, our understanding of the mind, because our mind can only see the mind part of it, the soul, the emotions. But true wholeness, right, was again what? It was everything, spirit, soul, body, those five things, the physical, spiritual, emotional, relational, financial, all those areas. God wants us to be whole and complete in all those areas as we walk out and just enter into his rest, entering into his rest. And some, for some of us, and, and for me, you know, I, I was in that same area. I had to teach myself how to relax, how to, how to be in a place of rest. You know, I think I shared this before, but I had lost a brother who was uh, 17 and I was 12. And having a tragedy like that happen can make your mind go places and you think about people dying all the time. That's how I, I got to that place where I, I could literally have a funeral in my mind of people that are still living. I know it sounds crazy, right? But I had to bring those thoughts captive. 
and say, hey, you know what? I need to bring those thoughts into the obedience of Christ and bring into the place of peace and confidence in God and say, no, we will have a long life. We will have long life in, 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 in him and through him and the things that we're going to do. And the last one, number three, receive his peace. Second Thessalonians 3.16 says, says this, Now may the Lord of peace himself grant you his peace. How many of you love just having God's peace in our life? Amen. The peace of his kingdom, now check this out, at all times, say all times, in all ways, under all circumstances, all conditions, whatever comes, the Lord be with you. We have to see this, that we, in any area we're at, we're walking now. You know, for a long time, I used to think about, you know, you read Psalms 91, right? Yeah, I, they, I dwell in the shadow of the Most High. So I always think about, well, if I'm going to be in God's peace, that means I've got to be off in this distant place, hiding out somewhere with God. But you know what? God wants us to be in that place with him, but then he says, I want you to go. But guess what? When we go, God is with us. Where at? All times, all ways, all circumstances, all conditions, whatever comes. He's with us and we walk in. So when we walk into our workplace, when we walk into that family member's home that, that is having a very difficult time, or the friends, or whoever it is, that place that we come into, we bring God's peace with us. We come in and we can change the atmosphere to what God wants to bring to them. We carry that with us. We carry it with us and bring that into them. We bring life. Amen? Amen. Last verse, Matthew 5, 9. Blessed are the peacemakers. Say peacemakers. For they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are the peacemakers. Right? Was Elijah a peacemaker? He was. Did Ahab see what he was doing in the beginning as a thing of peace? Here comes the guy causing all the trouble, right? You're the one that prayed and stopped the rain. But he knew that there was sin in the, in the area. There was sin that had to be dealt with. Being a peacemaker, you can bring correction. You can bring healing. You can bring whatever God wants you to bring into that situation. But you're the one that's entering in. You're the one that's coming in and you're making peace. Peace with Peace between you and God, peace with people around you, and maintaining. Now, is that always easy? <laughs> no, it's not. And we always have a part to play. And we talk about this in, in some of our marriage classes and things like that, that, you know, we can only manage ourselves. And we have to recognize that. We can't change people. We can't change the way they think, the way they view things. We can't change the experiences that they've gone through. We can't change the hurt that they have felt with life situations that are going on. But we can share the love of Christ. We can share the love. We can share the joy that God has with us to them. And we can bring something to them that they maybe wouldn't have been able to get anywhere else. That's a peacemaker bringing in what God wants to those places, bringing to people what they need, helping them to transform their mind, transform their hearts, bring physical healing, bring a word of knowledge, whatever it is. Because God wants to use you, every one of us. Whatever the circumstance may be, whatever the family situation may be, He wants to use us. And where does it begin? Very simply, and you'll hear Pastor Ralph say this all the time, it begins with a relationship with Christ, receiving him and making him the Lord of your life. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, if we confess with our mouth, believe in our hearts that, that God raised Jesus from the dead, that we too will be saved. He did all the work. Christ did all the work, right? Elijah was walking in the Old Testament. He heard from God, but most people, many people did not. In fact, no one did except for the prophets we can hear from God and be directly connected with him. And Jesus, when he died on the cross, he, he tore that veil of sin so that we can have connection directly with him. 
And all we have to do, as simple as it sounds, is just confess and accept Jesus and accept his, accept his forgiveness of our sins into our life. So I'm going to ask you, bow your heads and, and close your eyes. And we're going to pray together. And if you're watching online, I encourage you as well, just speak out loud and, and believe and receive what God has for you. Say this with me. Say, Father, I confess Jesus is Lord. Forgive me, Lord, of my sins. I receive your forgiveness. I receive your healing. And I receive your peace in my life. In Jesus' name, amen.